All right. Welcome, everybody, to Harmony Unleashed Live. My name is Stephen Feifke. We're here today with Russ Annixter, New York City-based music copyist and arranger, leader of Russ Annixter's Hippie Big Band. Russ, what is up, man? How are you? Good to see you. Hey. Thank you for being hey, here. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, Sweet. <laughs> so where are we tuning in from today? Me? Yeah. Where oh, are you? Where is this I'm, on the, I'm on the island of Staten. <laughs> the island of Staten. Awesome, yeah. man. That's great. Yeah. 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 Do you do you paint, by the way, in addition to so I paint my girlfriend is music? a is a painter. Okay, well, I do not paint. I cannot draw. Well, I could draw a straight line for copying music because I started out doing that by hand and it was almost beautiful. <laughs> um uh, my son is going to hopefully be an illustrator, but Allison does all these beautiful paintings. So yeah, no, those are they're those are all quite gorgeous. Yeah, thank you. So man, how'd you get into writing writing big band music, large ensemble music? Let's start there. What's your okay. into this landscape? Well, as things go, I started late. I mean, I you know, I I I did the in San Francisco, I did the junior high school band kind of thing. I started on trumpet, got kicked off trumpet, the baritone horn. Once I realized in high school that unless I just wanted to play in the pep band in the stands for basketball games and football games, I better learn trombone. So I taught myself trombone in Spanish class one day while the rest of the class was conjugating verbs. I figured out the combinant, the relationship between valves and the slide. And I went down and played trombone that day instead of baritone. And that pushed me in that direction. And I taught myself tuba at the same time. But I, I didn't realize that you had to really practice. You know, I practiced enough to learn whatever the band had to play or whatever the musical was we were doing. But I really didn't know that if you wanted to do this, you have to take your 10,000 ground balls. Um, I just, I, I didn't know. And uh, I, I took some lessons when I was a senior in high school. And it's like, oh, wow, there's like things you have to do, like long tones and lip slurs. And... So I got into it and I started college as a business major. I actually have a bachelor's degree in labor relations with a second major in music, but it was just general music. And I realized that I did not want to be a trombone major. I didn't really like the literature at the time. This is like in the late seventies. And I just, I didn't want to be a trombone player. I, I liked it as a means to an end. And, you know, it got me playing in the jazz ensembles. It got me playing in orchestra. And I think my roommate at the time says, and I, 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 there was a band. This is in Chico, California, a real small town. It's the music department is pretty much it. It's a factory for music teachers, and I didn't want to do that either. But there was an ad on the wall. It says former big band era professional, looking for players for a big band, and looking for arrangers. And I was good in the music theory classes in school i said oh, i think i could do this and this guy was like from the 1940s big band he played in boyd rayburn's band and um he knew stan kenton kenton was like his mentor but i don't think he ever wrote for the band he was a piano player so he wouldn't have played in the band but he they were putting together a 10-piece band in this little town and he was giving me arranging lessons in exchange for me copying his charts for the band and my first chart I copied was terrible. And he he says, R -r -r -r, you know, I had page turns in the middle of saxophone solis and everything I could have done wrong, I did wrong. And he he pulled out a Sammy Nestico chart and he goes, Russ, you've played trombone in big bands. You've seen things that look like this. And I said, um, uh, you mean people do that for a living? He says, yeah, they're called music copyists. So I bought Clinton Romer's book and I taught myself how to do that. And I would copy his charts and I studied his charts and he let me write charts for the band and they were terrible. Um, I mean, I made one mistake after another, but that is an important thing because I learned a lot from my mistakes. Uh, the more mistakes I made, the more I learned. And by the 
end of my college thing, I'd written a couple charts for the band that they kept in the book. And I started to get the hang of it. I did a reduction down to 10 pieces of uh, Basie's April in Paris. And I learned a lot from that. And I think my roommate said, you know, man, you're never going to be a professional trombone player. Maybe an arranger, probably could be a copyist. And that sent me kind of down that path. And then I moved back to San Francisco and I started playing in as many big bands in San Francisco as I could, like rehearsal bands. I'd be playing in big bands, you know, I gigged two or three times a month while I had a day job. All the while I was studying how to be a copyist, you guys were teaching me, like, you know, pen and ink. Um, and I, I did it. I had a day job and I kept getting promoted when all I really wanted to do was write music. So eventually, um, after eight years, I was looking to go to graduate school. I said, you know, these bands in San Francisco were good. I was okay playing in the sections on trombone or bass trombone. But I said, if I really want to write, I can't just write for these rehearsal bands. I really need to go somewhere. And I looked at Jimmy Jufri was teaching at New England. And Brooke Meyer was teaching at Manhattan School of Music. I was torn between the two. My then wife and I put all our belongings in storage and went on a long trip. And I visited Manhattan School of Music and I had a really good day there visiting. So I said, I'm going to go here. And I applied and I got in. And the eight years off in between college and graduate school really helped me with all the big band playing I did and all the experimental big band charts I did that was one mistake after another. Some of them were good. They had their moments, but it was all a learning experience. And I, I was really hoping that I would get to study with Brookmeyer. And I got there his last year and he wasn't taking new students. So I ended up studying for a year with Richard DeRosa. And I also did not pass the proficiency exam for piano. So I had to take three semesters with Gary Dial. So I learned, I had passed the theory proficiency exam entrance, but I learned so much theory, jazz theory from Gary Dial. And Rich taught me so much about voicing. And my second year of graduate school, when Brooke Meyer left, they brought in Manny Album, and I got to study with Manny for a year. And that was wonderful. And when I graduated, I kept studying with Manny for a year or two, and I became his copyist after his copyist retired. And I learned even more doing that. And you know, I became a professional copyist, and I tried to write when I could. Um, about 25 years ago, I wrote a set of Jimi Hendrix tunes for a big band and a set of Led Zeppelin tunes for a big band. And we did a concert and it, that kind of became, I could see that I had a direction there. It was combining the things that I, I really loved. And for a while, we had a 14 piece band playing my arrangements in the, like the old cutting room. And then I got busy as a copyist and I kind of put writing on the back burner. And, but I mean, I've been doing this for over 30 years. And about five years ago, separately, Tony Cadlick and my good friend Dan Levine, the trombone player, both said, dude, when are you going to start writing again? I said, if you, and they both said, if you write something, we'll play it. So I said, well, I don't want to do a big band. So I've kind of done that in all the phone calls. And I mean, you know what I'm talking here. So I said, but you know, I've always wanted to do like a 10 piece band. So the hippie big band was a 10 piece band at first. And I wrote nine charts and I called 10 of my friends and they came to the union and they read nine charts down and they were all pretty good. Some of them needed tweaking. And every one of them came up to me afterwards separately and said, if this is going to be a thing, I want to do it. So that happened. Um, I had stopped playing trombone, but I had bought a Fender bass. And that actually taught me too about other things that I didn't learn at Manhattan School of Music. So 
I'd gotten into Grateful Dead cover band. Then I was listening to a lot of Grateful Dead. And my son, when he was five, said, Dad, do we have to listen to this hippie music all the time? So I turned something else on. And the second rehearsal of my band, I had a substitute drummer named Warren Odes, who is so sage, we refer to him as the rabbi. And at the end of the rehearsal, I mean, we were doing a Grateful Dead tune, a couple of Led Zeppelin tunes, a Little Feet tune. And he said, this is a lot of fun. This is like hippie music for big band. So I remembered what my son said. And I said, okay, here's an idea. Here's a concept. And, you know, I just finished chart number 73 a couple of weeks ago, starting with nine charts. And I added a mallet percussion player, conga player. So now it's 11 pieces. So it's three saxophones with doubles, one trumpet, one French horn, a trombone, a bass trombone, guitar, bass, uh, was electric, now it's acoustic, and drums and a mallet percussion with some congas and toys. And uh, that that's the, the long story of a, a long journey. Man, it's an incredible story. I mean, wow, there's so much in there. We we started off in in California for, yeah. for a couple of years, then we took a long trip yeah. to New York. What year did you arrive in New York, did you say? 1990. 1990. Wow. 1990. And I started working a copy as a copyist my second year of graduate school. Yeah, man. Well, I want to talk about a, a, a couple of different things. Um, I want to talk about the copyist thing for mm -hmm. sure. And I also want to talk a little bit about, um, and maybe we can do this one first, just because it's the last thing that you spoke about. Mm -hmm. but just in terms of the difference between writing for big band and writing for a 10, now 11 piece ensemble. Mm -hmm. Do you approach those two different spaces differently? Do you approach them similarly? What is your general takeaway from the from the difference well, in size? Primarily? Arranging arranging like form is the same. I mean, right. what do you want to do with something? What kind of vibe do you want to put out? Mm -hmm. um, I started out just taking like the equivalent of what we would call in Broadway a piano vocal, like like, you know, a, a rock tune, I'd get the piano vocal version of it. And I was basically just coloring it. As I expanded a little bit, now I try and break it a little bit and uh, not just color, but stretch it and and all that and, you know, move things around. And, and that I don't think matters, whether it's an 11-piece band or an 18-piece band. But... With with an, with three saxes, I can't really do a sax solely, so that's out. I mean, I've tried doing it and like filling in a French horn and a trombone in between to fill it out, and it just doesn't work. They're they just not as they're not as uh, agile. No, it just doesn't work. It works for a little bit, and then you know, if you're doing thirty two bars, you kind of killed the two brass players, and so I I can't do that. So I have to find other things. Um, so that's one thing that goes away with an 11 piece band. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more really quickly. Yeah. Just, you know, when you close one door, another door opens. So yeah. by closing the sax solely door, you know, and removing some of those typical big band arrangement possibilities, mm -hmm. what kind of stuff have you found instead of the sax solely? Well, my use of doubles, I think there was a, an album it's like, what do I want for doubles? I want an alto, a tenor, and a berry. And there was an al an album called Mancini Combo. And it was Connie Condoli, Dick Nash, trumpet and trombone. And it was Ted Nash, not our Ted Nash, but the uncle on alto sax and flute. A guy named Ronnie Lang on baritone sax and alto flute. And believe it or not, Art Pepper on tenor sax and clarinet. And he was getting so many combinations out of that. And I said, okay, that's what I want my doubles to be. And then I said, well, what if I gave them each just one more double? And I've got guys playing in Broadway pits. I could ask them to bring seven instruments. and um, But I didn't want to do that. So I said, let me give them one more each. So I gave the tenor a soprano double. And I also gave the Barry a soprano double. 
and I wanted bass clarinet, and I put it on the alto chair. So I, I get a lot of combinations out of that that kind of makes it so I don't need a sax solely. Like, I love the combination of bass clarinet, soprano sax, and alto flute. Um, I use it a lot. And with French horn, it's almost like I have a, a fake woodwind quintet. Mm -hmm. Where do you put the French horn in that stack? Um, I don't necessarily voice it per se, but lines. Um, I mean, I can do things in three octaves that sound right. cool with the bass clarinet and the soprano sax and the alto flute on top. And I'm not afraid to go high with the alto flute. Yeah. Um, you know, people might go, what is that sound? Cool. You know, because it's, it's unusual to have the alto flute playing above the staff. And yeah. I do it all the time. You know what? You, have you ever heard that record, the the Gil Evans, um, Jimi Hendrix record? Dude, I, in the 70s in Chico, California, we had just heard about the birth of the cool. Right. And all that Gil Evans stuff. And I went to a used record store and I saw Gil Evans plays the music of Jimi Hendrix. And I thought it was a joke. I mean, just looking at the cover and I yeah. took it home and it was like life changing. Yeah, man. It's Talk like orchestration. Holy moly. Yeah. That yeah. record is just Gil in his finest form. And yeah. And, you know, I just get off on a small tangent. When I was playing bass, I met a guitar player. That, I mean, he's since passed away, but it's the closest I will ever get to playing with Jimi Hendrix. And he basically taught me how to play bass. And we were driving to a gig and I played that album for him. And he'd been playing Jimi Hendrix stuff for 35 years and he'd never heard that. And he was blown away. He was absolutely blown away. Yeah, that's that's pretty deep, man. Yeah. So, so and I use that as an example too. I mean, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of palette in there that I've transferred to my band. I mean, I look at my band. I'm not trying to compare my band to the Gil Evans Orchestra, but there's a lot I took from there, and a lot I took from the Birth of the Cool and the Mancini Combo album, and Marty Page stuff. Yeah, you gotta love Marty Page, man. Come on. Yeah. yeah. So, do you think that you would approach writing for big band? Do you approach writing for big band differently now that you've had this experience, kind of having to put the pieces of the puzzle together in that different way? No, with because with the smaller instrumentation. No, because horizontally, right? Yeah, horizontally, it's the same. It's just how do you go this way? And I found some voicings that I I, I took from my big band writing. Like one thing Manny Album told me is never be afraid to use fourths. Don't be afraid of force. And, you know, we, uh, I mean, doing these rock tunes that the guitars are playing roots and fifths, you know, I can't just have my guys, you, you, you have play the root and you have play the fifth. I mean, you know, so I don't necessarily change the, the chord st structure as far as changes, but I'll use jazz voicings um, up and down. I mean, the, the ninths and the thirteenths and the elevenths, if I, if I need them. And that all came from my, you know, what Rich DeRosa showed me for four trumpets and four trombones. And rather than taking out, like subtracting, I just kind of reinvented it a little bit. So I'm thinking, what did I learn there to support the lead trumpet? What does that trumpet need from the other people? And in this case, I've got seven blowers. And usually in my chord voicings, I use five of them. Maybe I'll have the berry or the bass trombone doubling a bass line. Uh, and I'll have maybe one of the other, like maybe the alto or tenor are blowing. So that leaves me five people left over and I'll use five voicings thinking similar to what I did with four trumpets and four trombones, but I've only got five of them. And, you know, you can get a lot with five different notes and I'll start at the top 
and go down in fourths. And then I'll usually take the lowest note and bring it up an octave. So I get the crunch in the middle with like fourths on either end. And I mean, to me, it, it, it sounds more than 10 players or 11 players. Um, I'm kind of faking, you know, like this Manny album would call it a sleight of ear trick to, um, and, and, you know, if I, if I started doubling some of those voices, I think it would make the band sound smaller. So um, that's kind of the formula. And I want it to sound like a big band, but it, it's, it's, and, you know, on Broadway, I mean, they used to have minimums of 24 people in the pits and now these shows are, you know, well, what was some like it hot? Was it like 14? It couldn't have been more than 18. I'm not sure. Yeah. So they're, they're faced with the same things. How do you make 14 sound like uh, 21? And they're faced with that all the time. And I kind of have used some tricks that I've learned copying those shows to do that. Let's talk about the copying thing. I think yeah. that, you know, younger arrangers uh, earlier and, you know, younger meaning like, and er, like more recently into the writing landscape, let's say, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, sometimes the importance of, you know, mentorship and apprenticeship mm -hmm is sometimes a little bit overlooked. And you mentioned, you know, you you would trade lessons for engraving charts, for copying mm -hmm. charts. You know, when I first uh, graduated college, one of my first apprenticeships was with um, David Berger. And so mm -hmm. I was, in, in, you know, engraving for Dave. And, mm -hmm. and you learn so much just from checking out somebody else's score. And oh, sure. Copying it and engraving it. And I loved what you just said about, you know, you're, there's so, I mean, man, there's so many amazing nuggets in there but just making the smaller ensemble sound like the larger ensemble and just making sure that it's got everything in there the sleight of ear is a great mm -hmm. quote I'm, i might i might i yeah. might borrow that but yeah. you know just just that was many so yeah for sure and man like russ you're I, I don't even know what to say like nyc staple nyc like you you just you you do so much here and i love the fact that you just said that you learn so much from from engraving all of these shows. It yeah, just, like, although it just I've never called it engraving. Or copying. <laughs> yeah, because so, that's something else. But Well, um, copying, and, and in terms of the, like, just keeping an open mind and just yeah. learning from everybody. Yeah. I, it's really deep, man. You well, know? thanks. Yeah, it. I mean, we have, you know, I'm, I'm not, well, I will name one name, and that's Danny Trube, who, uh, did most of Alan Menken's musicals, not just on Broadway, but in the theater. Danny had never written for an orchestra and he orchestrated the animated Beauty and the Beast like 30 years ago, whatever it was. And, mm. you know, looking at Danny's scores for 25, 30 years have taught me so much. Um, by the same token, I've seen things. We have a a saying, oh, this guy sure can make 14 players sound like five. Talk and, to me more about that, man. Well, oh, without naming names. Yeah. I mean, well, because I think it's an interesting thing to, yeah. to, to talk about. Just, you know, yeah. we're talking about how to make fewer instruments sound like more, yeah. but the reality is that even if you've got like an 18 piece big band, yeah. Sometimes that thing can sound like it's just a yeah, like a couple of horns well, if it's not orchestrated. Well, one one thing I noticed that when Manny would write for a big band, he never wrote anything for the piano. Dang. Okay. And well, was, like no well, slash marks or like no nothing, nothing. Wow, I mean, rests. he wouldn't write piano parts. I mean, he would, you know. And like I've heard your music and I've heard you play piano with your big band, but you know your charts and you're playing. You know what. The other guys are doing that's true okay mm -hmm. okay so so long as i can well, remember well that's you know <laughs> but um i've even heard david berger say this that you know doubling the ensemble with piano makes the band sound smaller depending and, okay. on the part of the ensemble yeah I yeah agree that for sure. and you know if if you've got you know four trumpets and four trombones and you've got 
you know, if you're just given chord symbols that say C7, but there's a ninth and a sharp 11 and a 13 in there, what is the piano supposed to do? So, yes. or you have, or you have to be really specific or you have to write them out voicings, which, you know, is kind of hard to groove. I would imagine, I mean, my piano playing is terrible. So I'm just supposing that if you have to read all that stuff, it's going to be harder to groove. So he would save the piano for accompanying solos. He would do some high right hand stuff in the piano, maybe doubling flute lines. Or if there was a happening bass line, he'd have the piano playing octaves with, in the left hand with that. But it's kind of like knowing what to double and what not to double. Um, if you have a... If you have... If I had five horns and I only wrote triads and I had certain notes doubled it's like a waste and i've even seen that in shows where like the one trombone is doubling the barry sax like at the top of the staff i'm like why aren't they in octaves you know if you're doing it in octaves you're going to get more mileage out of those two players than if you've just got them in unison and unisons can be effective but you know, you, you can't, if when you only have a few players, you can't waste them. You know, you have to, that's why I use like five note, it, it, you know, it, I think it sounds bigger than just, you know, okay, I've got the root or only, you know, I've got the third and the seventh doubled and then a fifth and the bass is playing the root and that's just not going to sound big. It's going to sound like eight players it's going to sound like three man yeah it, it's such an interesting conversation the orchestration yeah. you know just the and the orchestration just brings the arrangement that you've already written to life yeah. which I, is why i think it's so important to just gain as much clarity as possible on what yeah. you actually want to say before you say it you know in writing yeah. music just like writing a letter yeah. you have the ability to really spend that time figuring out like what is the best way of communicating this what is the best way of saying what i'm trying to say right now yeah so yeah man, well <laughs> let's talk a little bit more about copying versus engraving you said it means two right. different things nobody knows what that is better than you well let's, let's about when i hear when i hear that. engraving i think of somebody preparing something for publication interesting okay and you know, there's a lot of people, I don't know if Kendor is still in business or Hal Leonard or whatever. There's people that work for them, taking people's big band charts and getting them ready for publication. And I've seen the user groups and, you know, people are going, where should the mezzo forte be? Should it be right below the note head or should it be right in front of the note head? You know, and they're talking things at a pixel level. And, for you know, for publishing, it should be. But I think of what I do as more of like a mash unit, like from the, the old TV show. It's like I get 3,000, 3,500, 4,000 bars of music for a Broadway show. We used to have six weeks to do it. Now we have four weeks to do it just because of the way rehearsals are now and saving money at that level. And when you had six weeks the orchestrator wouldn't get an assignment until the first week and a half. The first week and a half of cast rehearsals, they're figuring out keys, they're figuring out dance routines. They're figuring out what they want to do before they give it to the orchestrator. And now the rehearsal periods with the cast and the dance arranger being in the room are four weeks. But that week and a half didn't go, didn't change. So now in a four-week rehearsal period, that first week and a half, we don't see anything. And now we have to copy all that in two and a half weeks. And, you know, you don't have That's time. Well, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, maybe, I, maybe I'm old, but, you know, in MASH, you know, when those soldiers came in, the MASH unit got them ready to send them to a real hospital. You know, it's just like, fix them up, move them out. And we're taking music and we're moving it out as quickly as possible. 
and yet it has to be presentable and it has to be readable by a sub. It has to be, you know, every player has got a list of five subs for their show. And now with COVID, sometimes they'll bring in just anybody that plays that instrument at the last minute because they have to. So in my opinion, the music has to be presentable for a sub to come in and sight read with little preparation. Yet we only have two or three weeks to do it. So I want it to be clean and accurate, but I can't really, you know, if that dynamic is three pixels away from where it would be in publications, I can't worry about it. But yet it still has to be teachable to a sub. So you got to find that we have to find a balance to move it quickly and yet presentable. Um, what is the number one thing that is the most important thing about copying a chart? Form. What do you mean by form? Well, first of all, the pay, the pay scale, the union says that it should be 10 lines on a page and four bars on a line. Roughly. I mean, you know, most of these songs are eight bar A, A, B, A, you know, so four, and are we four. talking about um, letter paper? No, we're talking about. Or B5? Well, this is cut up, but it's nine and a half by 12 and a half, missing yeah. a piece. <laughs> so just That's okay. It. I'm sure it was used for, for something good. Well, right now it's like just figuring things out, but this was the standard form. Yeah. And when That's we. great to I, see. I was, you know, I wasn't one of the first computer copyists, but I was working with the first computer copyists in Finale. And they took everything that we learned by hand from that look and tried to make it the same, look the same, just uh, computer notated. So all those rules we learned from the Clinton Romer book, we tried to apply to the computer. And, you know, back then you had, there were 10 music copying offices in New York and they all had a dozen people working there. And now there's probably three offices like that. And, you know, the computer has, I mean, look, I, I sat in, in rooms with older copyists, you know, and they showed me how to do things by hand. And when we first started doing things with a computer, it worked that way too. We all sat in the same room and we figured things out together. Now everybody's, you know, we're working more remote, but so now, like I'm going to be 65 in a couple of weeks and I think I'm one of the youngest people that still knows how to use a pen. Okay. Um, but that, that mentorship or, chain up the ladder, whatever you want to call it, is gone. But it doesn't have to be. You know, people have the notation software, whether it be Finale or Sibelius. And I, I see people much younger than me that know both of those programs better than I do. And I've been using them for a long time. But they don't necessarily know what a part of music is supposed to look like. And But nobody's showing them. You know, it's like, oh, I've got Finale. I can copy your show. And I'll I'll see this stuff. And, you know, the, the union scale sheet is not just an accounting method of, of counting pages and bars. It's that way for a reason, because the music was usually in four-bar phrases. Or if it's a nine-bar phrase, you get four and five, or whatever it is. But you want to see the phrases laid out on the paper. If you have an eight bar phrase, you don't want to see five bars on one line and three bars on the next line. And then the beginning of the next of the bridge in the middle of the page, you know, you want to see it in four bar phrases. Cause that's generally, generally what the music is. Obviously there's exceptions. So you, you, I, I, I was supposed to play for a student production of Rent on, on electric bass. 
and a, an okay electric bass player, but not professional level. And I can read music, but I asked the guy at MTI to send me the student version of Rent, the bass part, so I could learn it. And there was no phrasing at all. And it was not a difficult bass part, but I couldn't read it. It was like note to note to note to note to note to note. But if it had been in four bar phrases, I would have been able to see the harmonic structure easier and I wouldn't have had to think as much. I could just make music. I wouldn't have to figure out, now what are we doing here? That's why I say on a part that phrasing is the most important part. I mean, I can always teach somebody, no, the, the, the articulation goes on the note head side. Oh, okay. But getting the feel of how the music is going to breathe on the page is you either can understand it or you can't, I think. And that's what I look for when people send me samples. You know, if I see they've crammed 13 bars on one page, you know, it's not showing me that they're thinking musically. Um, so that I think, I think form is, is the most important part. I love that you just said that even when, I mean, not in these exact words, but even when copying, just thinking musically and just retaining that, that, mm -hmm. that process throughout the whole yeah. thing. Cause co copying is absolutely a part of the writing process, you know, it is, it, it is. And I actually, is. I actually felt more part of it when I was doing it by hand. I That's super more, interesting. I yeah. felt more, and I felt a little further removed when people were handing me hand scores and I had to enter it into Finale. And now most people are sending me files and I basically spend my time as an editor. And, you know, people say, what is the music like for the show? And I don't really know because I'm not inside the notes. I'm like correcting grammar, like making sure that there's not a quarter note and a half note rest and a quarter note, you know, or, uh, making sure you can see the middle of the bar and make, you know, so it, it's, it's come to that, but, um, when you're writing music for the, for your, for the hippie big band, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a strange question to ask, but I've, I've never had the chance to ask you or any other like mm -hmm. professional copyist this question, but do you, do you sometimes think about the music in a visual sense, like what it's going to look like on the page? And do you, do those lines ever cross for you? I don't even know if this yeah, question makes I, you sense. Know, I, well, I'm, I'm thinking about composing from the copyist's well, perspective and vice versa. Music, music is, I don't want to, it's probably more visual to me than it is oral at this That's point. super interesting. I, I don't have... A more about that? Well, like, I barely passed the bonehead ear training class in graduate school. I probably would do much better now. Yeah. Particularly after playing bass. Right. But, um, I mean, I see music. Like, I can look at, I can look at something and say, I can do that for my band. Like, I can look at um, some a piano music and go, that would be a good brass quintet. I can see it. Um, I can look at a piano vocal and depending what's in on the piano vocal without even hearing it, I can say, oh yeah, I can see that. There's a bass part. There's some guts in the middle to voice. That's a, a nice melody. Um, but it's, it, it, it's very visual. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, it's so interesting to hear your, your perspective on that. And also just to call out what you said about the ear training thing being easier for you now that you've, you know, become a better bass player as well. Ooh. You know, just thinking about harmony from the bottom up. You know, even though we hear it top down, we feel it bottom up. Well, I, 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 yeah, I've had a propensity for low instruments. I mean, bass, yeah. trombone, and tuba, and so ba bass. You know, I mean, I could, I had played lead trombone, but I, I was better at the bottom. So I hear from the bottom up, and I, I tend to write from the bottom up. Although there's the melody, so I, you know, but. I mean, I, I will do that that voicing that, like I described, which is from the top down, but I'm very conscious. What is my bass trombone going to do? And what is my Barry going to do? Counterpoint. Or are they going to be part of the voicing? Or are they going to be with the with the bass? But I'm very conscious about what is what are my low guys going to do? Totally, man. 
Well, hey, let's let's talk about let's let's change the subject just a little bit here because I know you've got this gig coming up with the hippie big band featuring Osnoy, the incredible guitarist Osnoy. So maybe we can talk a little bit about mm-hmm. how you approach kind of writing and featuring, you know, well, featuring different instruments in the ensemble. In this mm-hmm. case, you know, Oz and and the guitar. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. Open well, floor it, it, on that. It, it, it's been a bit of a puzzle. I have a guitar in my band, and I want him to be there. Yeah. So, so we're gonna do. Of course. The we're gonna do. Merrier. We're gonna do three tunes without Oz. I shouldn't. But we'll give too much away. We're gonna do some yeah. tunes. We're gonna warm up for Oz. Bring them on. Yeah. And we're doing two two Oz charts. I arranged two two of Oz's compositions. Um and so for six numbers, maybe plus a secret encore, they're all gonna have an Oz solo in them. But I also wanted to make sure I picked tunes that had uh solo space for my my regular players. Uh, at least well, I've got a vibes player that's a world class soloist. Um, and Michael Aaron's my guitar player is a great soloist. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, Oz, can we, you know, have like a guitar jam in one of these things? And he's like, absolutely. So there's that. But I wanted to make sure that my tenor player, Stan Harrison, gets a solo on tenor and on soprano. I wanted to make sure my Barry player gets a solo on Barry and also on another on soprano i want to make sure my trombone player gets a feature make sure my trumpet so i had to pick that so that everybody gets a piece so that's always a concern when i'm planning a set is like do i have like eight trumpet solos and no alto solo you know you got to make sure that it's all balanced and and everybody that blows gets a feature or you know room to blow so there was that part of it and you know, you want to pick tunes that, you know, represent what the band does separate from having a guest guest artist, too. So um, those were all thoughts, excuse me, that went into this. It's super exciting, man. Yeah. And do, do, am I remembering correctly that there's also recording featuring Oz out on YouTube with your band? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> no, no, okay. no. I mean, Oz. Oz has subbed a couple times in the band. Okay. And I maybe have secretly, clandestinely recorded the rehearsal when I'm not supposed to. But so I have recordings that I don't share with Oz in the band. But if I do a gig at the cutting room or the bitter end or someplace or you know, and they give me the video feed. I'm not shy about posting those on Facebook or on, or on YouTube or both. But um, no, nothing with the band in Oz yet, but hopefully there'll be some stuff up afterwards. Awesome, man. Well, I look forward yeah. to seeing and hearing it. Yeah. Um, well, man, I want to I want to just, you know, say a huge thank you for 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 chatting with us today. It's just such an a really I mean, you're you're. Bad dude, Russ. I appreciate it. So, so. And, you know, um, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the chance, you know, because I've been a copyist for so long and trying to get known as an arranger. You know, when, I, you know, look, I've been blessed to have had a successful career as a copyist. And, you know, I still have some years left at it. But, um, you know, to try and get known, like when people hear my music, for example, we did we did a con we did part of the U- a union's hundred year centennial thing during right at the end of the pandemic. We played in Central Park at the Banshell, and there's people that have known me for thirty years that had no idea I could do that. And and that's been the trick now. It's like how do I, you know, and 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 man, this advice for anybody: you get known as a piano player. And you're a good arranger, not necessarily you, but just somebody that's a piano player. You know, how do you get known as an arranger after people just think of you? Oh, you're a piano player or you're a trumpet player. You know, how do you get known as another thing at that level? And that's been a journey for me the last five years, too. It's like, oh, that guy that passes out music at carols a couple times a year is writing charts. So, 
Um, I appreciate the chance to get some exposure here and, and share. Man, it's an absolute pleasure. Seriously. Um, well, I want to, I want to close with, you know, I have three questions that I ask every single person okay. that comes on here. Do you mind if we do a little speed round? And the, the, the answers don't have to be speed round, by the way. Okay. The, it's just the questions are All right. pretty planned in this case. All right. The only three. All right. So ready? The first one is what do you wish you knew when you first started composing? However long ago, when you first started arranging for big band, what is the one thing that you wish you could go back and tell yourself, if you could just whisper one thing in, in, in young Russ's ears, what would that one thing be? In terms it of doesn't have so arranging. much to do with arranging, but getting your foundation music skills together. Like I said, I started late. I really didn't understand practicing until I was about 20 or 21. I mean, literally when I, my last three years of college, I, you know, practiced three hours a day plus ensembles. So, but I didn't do that until I was like 20 or 21. But if I had done that when I was 14 or 15, I, you know, maybe I would have actually taken the 10,000 ground balls. So I think I would tell young Russ, maybe I took 5,000 ground balls, but not 10,000 ground balls. So I think I would have tell, told Russ, go take your 10,000 ground balls. Beautiful, man. Sage advice again. Yeah. All right. The yeah. second question is this. What is the one thing that you learned along your journey that really helped unlock that next level for you in terms of your writing? The one that's actually thing. kind of recent. Um, that's actually kind of recent. Like during the pandemic, um, Stephen Bernstein has kind of become my 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 guru, whether he knows that or not. But when I listen to Stephen's music, sometimes I can't tell where the arranging ends and the improvisation begins. And I think that's an important thing that I've learned recently is like, it's okay that you don't know that, <laughs> you know, it's like they should be integrated and trying to integrate them so that they, it just becomes fluid and organic um, has been a, a recent light bulb experience goal kind of thing so it's not just head solos head or in big band however that you know head expensive but to just make it flow a little bit better so you can't tell is it written is that improvised and and so musicians can't even tell that's that's been an unlocking process that i'm, I'm actually currently uh still learning that's awesome man um well look the next question is sort of a, you know it's it's similar to actually what you've just said which is totally cool i'm going to ask it anyway mm -hmm. and um the question is what are you working on right now what is that next level that you're reaching for right now just keeping the band interested you know bringing stuff in that, that wows my band i mean even if we don't play for anybody else which i hope we do i want the band interested and i want it fun for the band so it's like i think during the pan you know during the pandemic i wrote i know during that year and a half i wrote 30 charts like that's amazing man and and some of them I haven't heard yet. And some of them I don't think I ever care if I hear. I mean, it was just something to do that day and maybe I'll hear them and maybe I won't. But I want to keep them interested. I want to keep writing, um, find new ways to do it that aren't just me coloring in from a piano vocal. I want to like push the um, the structures. I want to learn more about the actual moving things around and making it interesting for the band, like deconstructing things and putting them back together. The challenge is the band makes it fun for them. And if the band is having fun, it's contagious. People have said That's when so they so true right there, man. People will say when they see my band, I mean, these guys are taken off from their shows. 
to come play for a fraction of what they would be making that night in a pit. But people have said your band looks like they're having fun. And if I can do that, if I can keep them having fun, then it's contagious. That's awesome, Russ. Well, the contagion of fun just hit me over here. March 29, right? March 29, with your March 29 930 at the cutting room. Um, we've got like a room. I actually had to pull some charts from the list because I think we're going to have a good 90 minutes of music. Some blowing, awesome, some stretching out. Oz is, if you haven't heard Oz Noy, he's amazing. He's like one of the coolest people I've ever met. Maybe he'll hear this and be embarrassed. I hope not. But he's like, he's awesome. And and the band was so excited that he came in. And he had a good time today. Uh, so um, it's going to be a good show. I hope many people that hear this can make it. Awesome, Russ. Well, man, right. thank you so much for joining us. Right. You're and the man. Oh, you're the man, too. You know, I love your music, man. It's Thank like, you uh, very much. It's, uh, you know, some of you young cats are amazing me. Um you know, the skill level that, that you have and, and, uh, um, you know, when I hear your music, I keep getting surprises. So that's exciting. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. Especially yeah. coming from you. Thanks, man. All right, Russ. All right. Yeah, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Good music, everybody. Good music, everybody.